All right, I think you're good to go. And, Excellent. Uh, uh, before we start, I should say if anyone's got questions along the way, uh, you can type them in and ask questions uh, using the chat system. So prefer to do that rather than interrupt Steve if he's in the middle of something. But Steve, maybe you can just pause occasionally and ask for questions as well. Yeah, and no, where do you find the chat thing, Tim? Uh, if you move your mouse over the window, it should pop up the bar with... Uh, I'm just on the tablet. Share your screen. No idea. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Um, all right, Jenny, can you turn that off? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, listen, it's, um, I, I've, I've got um, pick contest um, uh, prep. Uh, Harry DeLore uh, is a very hard act to follow. Uh, he's a very inspirational man, and um, uh, his talk on preparation, I thought, was very relevant for us as well, um, not just for doing big flights, or big flights across country, but also um, uh, preparing for a competition and um, preparation is really key to it. So um, I'm going to, uh, one of the good things about preparation is that it's, um, it's actually uh, fun to do it as well. It's, it's actually enjoyable and um, uh, just going through the preparation process is, is really important. I thought I, what I'd do is I'd start by uh, looking at what I did before my first competition and uh, what sort of preparation I did uh, to get to that stage, even though it was about 40 years ago. Um, looking back at my logbook, um, my first cross country with Finn was at 25 hours. Uh, I was practicing short landings at um, 30 or 40 hours. Uh, cross country, I was uh, flying cross country at 50 hours and practicing uh, contest turn point photos. I had my Silver Sea by the time I got to 60 hours. First paddock landing at 76 hours and then um, I uh, bought a third chair in a label and um, that's where I really started to do uh, a lot more cross country and my time shot up. Um, my first competition wasn't until I'd done about 170 hours but I had under my belt uh, 23 cross-country flights uh, and half a dozen paddock landings. Uh, just prior to the competition, I'd done a paddock selection flight with Rosemary Gatlin and uh, um, a motor glider. Um, and uh, the first competition, we only had three days in the competition, uh, but I managed to get around every day, even though it was rather slow. Um, but getting around was, was uh, um, made it enjoyable and, uh, and ensured I was preparing myself for the next, next flight. So what I got out of that is I'd actually done quite a lot of cross-country flying before I started uh, getting into competitions. Everybody is different, so uh, I'm not saying that that's what everybody should do. Uh, you've got to find your own niche and students have to. Uh, find where um, where they feel their preparation is ready for a competition or not. Um, winning and losing, I don't think that um, it really matters. I think participation in competitions is what it's all about. Uh, winning is really nice, um, and but some of my best competitions are when I haven't done so well, and I've actually learnt heaps and heaps out of it. So, The main thing is to keep things, uh, keep it safe. Uh, you need two things when you're um, going cross country. You need skill and you need ambition. So um, a lot of people uh, have plenty of skill, but they have, they're just not keen to go cross country or uh, do competitions and that's fine. Um, there's a lot of people want to do competitions and do lots of cross country flying, but they haven't developed the skills that they need to do the job and then if you do that too early, you can either end up giving yourself a bit of a fright and, and, uh, and then that doesn't encourage you to keep going in competitions at all. Um, I don't want to sort of go through all the 
contest preparation stuff that you do in a QGP. Um, it's part of our syllabus training, and uh, I think everybody should go through that themselves. Uh, and but I want to talk about um, more the mental aspects of uh, flying in a competition and preparing for it. And I think it's quite good to look at the things that um, perhaps don't go well or get frustrating for people and uh, just see what the analogies of that is. One is uh, landing out all the time. Uh, that can be very frustrating and puts people off competitions. Um, the analogy to that is to kind of uh, analyze your flights, try and just make it around the task uh, rather than trying to win the task. Uh, so sometimes if you're landing out all the time, probably trying too hard. Um, a lot of people finding lift a lot weaker than they expect. So you front up to a competition thinking you're going to get 10 knots and then we'll get 10,000 feet and whiz around the task really quickly. Reality is that uh, you often get almost no lift and you can barely uh, get to the first turn point. So um, I guess uh, that's just part of competition flying and you've just got to remember that uh, everybody else is in the same boat and uh, you just keep practicing it and, and um, it will come with time. Uh, just perhaps go with the expectation that uh, it's not going to be spectacular and then if you do get a spectacular day, uh, that's a bonus. Equipment failures, uh, that's just part of uh, the course, you need to actually uh, try and know your equipment and learn about it. If you have an equipment failure, next time you do another day or another competition, you'll be better prepared next time round. Uh, hope you learn from it. Um, GPS issues, yeah, you've got to get on top of that. It's something you've got to practice. Do little um, cross-country tasks with your GPS. Get to know the GPS, how it works, and uh, before you do the competition. Um, Having an accident, uh, that's really serious. That can really put people off. So uh, I think um, certainly early time competitions, the main thing is to always try and do safe paddock lands all the time. Um, all the other personal things, um, currency, sleep, uh, being hydrated is all really important as well. Uh, food, make sure your finances are right. Uh, work, if you're working really hard and you're front up to a competition, uh, after a real stressful time at work, it's probably not the best thing to do. I usually find if you take a day or two days off uh, work before the competition, it'll actually prepare you much better than just fronting up to the competition straight from work. Um, contest rules, good idea to sit down and read the contest rules before the competition and knowing airspace. Um, so I get out a VNC map, study it uh, before the competition. It's all very well having it all on your PDA, your UDI or whatever, but um, it can be uh, quite confusing. And it's where a lot of people go wrong and get frustrated. Right, um, any questions so far? Right. Okay, well I'll carry on to the other part of the discussion and that's uh, AAT. And I'll see if I can bring up my share screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Sure can. Thanks, Tom. All right, um, I, I really like AATs. Uh, I think a lot of other people do as well. Um, they've been around for about 20 odd years now. Uh, they give you heaps of flexibility, especially for uh, newer pilots. Uh, um, I remember one of our newer cross-country pilots finished um, 45 minutes under time, uh, but he was beaming ear to ear because it was the first time he'd actually got around a task. So uh, yeah, there's good things that can, can happen with that. Uh, now, next screen. Okay, so this is um, when you're doing a, uh, an AAT task, the first thing that happens is uh, contest, you get handed a briefing sheet and it shows uh, where you've got to go 
and uh, the size of the circles, and you need to key that into your PDA equipment. And so you need to um, be able to do that. Um, you can see, I think this is the last day of the nationals, and I think it was the day Tim won from memory. Important things there are the task duration. So you can see there it's two hours 15, and really important you get that right and put it into the PDA um, accurately. If you um, I remember a contest I put in two hours inadvertently, and uh, so I finished the task in two hours, and I was 15 minutes under time. So uh, a small error, but quite consequential. Um, so it, it cost me lots of points. The task here you can see is from uh, minimum is 247 kilometers, uh, right up to nearly 400 kilometers. And if you're looking at the centers of the circles, you're looking at 265 kilometers. So um, I'm pretty sure this day, I think Tim did something like 214 kilometers. So uh, it was a fairly weak uh, day and a lot of people just, just basically touching the circles and uh, were trying to get around. So calculations for that, um, I drew up a little, um, time versus distance scale to see um, what the best tactics are. And you can see that two hours 15 and the minimum task distance 146. So it was, uh, um, so you could go below 70 kilometers now, probably about 58 kilometers now to do the shortest uh, task. And if you went 400 kilometers, uh, well, in two hours, you'd have to be doing about 180 kph. So this was a very um, a big task if you wanted to go right to the circle. So if it was a strong day, you, you would really want to go. The, a little chart like this will just give you an idea for, to prepare. Um, you know it's going to be two hours 15. So the best thing, you've got to study meteorology with this as well. So getting a uh, something from SkySight or uh, RASP is really important to pick when the best part of the day is. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about competition tactics as such as uh, things like flight following and etc. But picking the best part of the day is actually really important. A lot of people leave the start way too late or start way too early and um, you need to look at the meteorology part of things. So this is an AAT task, just uh, drawn in, uh, yeah, just a basic diagram of it. Some tactics, um, the start line. Um, the start, always with uh, doing AAT tasks, it has a lot to do with convergences. So you're always looking for convergences. If you have uh, a convergence somewhere near the start line and it's left or right hand side, start where the convergence is. So, um, but if you are trying to maximize um, the distance, it's a good idea. In this instance, uh, it's a good idea to start on the right hand side if you're going for maximum distance. So if it's a reasonably good day, um, start uh, on the, the right hand side if the task is going off to the left. Um, and if you think it's going to be a really, really weak day, then obviously start on the left hand side of the task. Sometimes these start lines can be really big, um, so as a six kilometers long. So it does make a difference uh, which side you start. Uh, good idea to go as deep as you can into the first turn point, and the reason is that that gives you options further around the task. If you start by just touching the circle and it turns out to be a really strong day, uh, you won't have covered as much distance as everybody else. So if you start, um, if it's a good day and you start on the outside, you can always shorten your task uh, just by uh, going to the nearest part of the circles um, to get around. And it's a good idea to try and finish just over the assigned task time. So two hours 15, uh, I think Tim won the day and you did two hours 24, so it's just a bit over the task. 
Um, having navigation equipment, yep, pretty essential kit for an AAT. Yeah, could you do an AAT without without a PDA? Yeah, I guess you could actually. Um, it's a pretty wide start circle and the circles are pretty big. Um, and I guess you could use your watch to try and time yourself. Um, but the problem is you wouldn't get it very accurate and you wouldn't be making the most of the AAT. Um, pretty hard to, to, to win when times are only a few kilometers apart. Uh, there's a navigation setting on uh, both uh, Navitar and XSOR, and there's also um, other really good instruments out there, uh, Alex Nav and Alex Nav Navigation, Top Hat, Alex 8000, and lots more. Three settings you really need are Delta Time, and that tells you if you're flying under or over your task time. So uh, generally I've been setting my task to the minimum task, and then um, trying to get uh, the delta time to match up with my uh, finish time as time goes on. That encourages me to go further into the circles. Um, the other way to do it is to match it to the what you expect the conditions to be, so match it to the weather, and actually have your task going to where you think the weather is going to be best, and that's probably a better way of doing it. Um, task speed, um, really important to have that to know how fast you're going. Uh, if you are going at 100 kilometers per hour, for instance, and then suddenly you strike a slow bit, um, then uh, you, you know about it. And if you get a fast bit, then you can speed up. Task required speed, and that's another. So those three are really, really good. Um, it tells you the speed you need to complete the task. So if you're halfway around the task and it tells you you need to go 200, 200 kilometers an hour, 500 kilometers an hour, you know it's time to turn around and head for home. There is some really good information on the Cumulus Soaring website, uh, and that's written by a guy called Richard Crawley. Uh, and it talks about putting AAT tasks into uh, Navitar UDI but it can apply to all instruments. So if you get the chance to read that, please do. It's, it's got some really, really good stuff on it. Um, task time. Now yeah, I said try and finish the task uh, slightly over the finish time. I think most people are aware of that. If you are under time, um, I've got an example here of say a two hour AAT task over 200 kilometers. Um, the pilot does 200 kilometers and does it in an hour 45, so he's 40, 15 minutes under time. Raw speed is 114 kph, but the task uh, is two hours, so his speed is scored at 100 kph. So what he's losing is 14 kilometers an hour, or the extra distance that he could have been covered is in two hours was 28 kilometers. So what this shows is it's really costly to finish early. Um, but the other side of the story is if it's a, if the day is bad, if it's really, really weak, uh, it's still better to finish uh, than to not finish at all. So uh, again, it's about your assessment of what the weather's doing and how that's going. Over time, uh, a lot less costly. Um, raw speed um, counts then because uh, it's what, how fast you go. Um, if you're over time, it's, the reason for being just over time is that the final glide uh, becomes a bigger percentage of your flight. So on a 100 kilometer flight and perhaps a 30, hour, a 30 kilometer final glide, it works out to 15% of the flight. So if your final glide speed is 76 knots, which is not that fast, that's 141 kph. Um, so your overall speed is going to increase uh, as a result of your final glide. If you were to go out to three hours instead of two hours, uh, still at 100 kph and you had a 30 kilometer final glide, uh, the final glide is only 10% of that flight. So um, uh, 
for the 100 kilometer, uh, sorry, the two hour task, you're, uh, you're getting an extra six kilometers an hour. The three hour task, you're only getting an extra four kilometers an hour, meaning you're only getting a, a two kilometer an hour advantage um, by going 300 kilometers. So the trick is that if the last 100 kilometers is in really, really good air, then, and it's worth more than two kilometers an hour, then go for it. Uh, the other side of it is that if you're going bigger distance, uh, it can mean uh, a negative risk as well of more speed. So, and you could land out. Uh, AAT turn points at 90 degrees. So you can see on this diagram, uh, the point C to E, if you try and aim for somewhere on that point, uh, the greatest distance goes right to, to point D, which is on the top left hand corner. Um, if you fly to A, C or D, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Uh, so just go as far into the turn point as you can. I think that's the important thing. But the main thing is to follow convergence lines, follow where the lift is. Uh, and that's really important. Um, I'll just pause there, Tim. Has anybody got any questions so far? I'm sort of going at a cracking pace here. Tim? No, no, there's no questions uh, yet. But, uh, Steve, uh, just one thing. Is there any advantage to go outside the circle if it was really booming outside past, you know, away from the next direction? Yep. So to carry on At past the circle a little bit? Is that Abs worthwhile or is that... Absolutely, if you catch, it, it depends on how far outside the circle you go. Uh, it depends on how strong the thermal is. If you're getting a 10 knot thermal and it's just outside the circle, uh, go for it because uh, that's going to give you uh, a, a better glide into the next turn point. But understand the moment you go outside the circle, it's like stopping. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, uh, a similar sort of situation where uh, you have a circle and you go, you don't go in a straight line. It's quite important to try and go in a straight line if you can. The more straight lines, the better distance you're going to cover. So um, this is an out and return type um, turn point. So really straightforward if you are flying, um, say on the outside of the, the circles and you um, go to um, point C, uh, and then you decide, well, I'm going to actually go uh, around the circle until I get to the maximum distance at point A. Now, um, what that involves, if you can do it very, very fastly, yes, it's worthwhile doing, but you're actually having to cover extra distance to do it. So if there was no lift between C and A, um, you'd better just to turn around at point C and go back um, or go to the next turn point. Um, back to next turn point from there. Um, the other option is before you get to the turn point is to line up more to fly towards point A and then you've got more of a straight line. But again, it depends on where the convergence is. This type of turn point uh, competition tactic that's important to understand, this applies not just to AATs but any turn point. Uh, if you've got a headwind, go in hard, in other words, uh, fly fast and, and low and come out soft. So, um, and the opposite in a tailwind, if you had a tailwind going into this turn point, uh, just um, keep trying to keep as high as you possibly can going into the turn point, as high as you possibly can at point A. And then when you come out, go as fast as you can and, and um, uh, try and make the most of the thermals in the headwind. So um, that's not particular to AATs, it's, it's, it covers any of them. Right. Now the one that um, I find is uh, a lot more difficult to understand is when you've got a far more expansive angle on a turn point. So in other words, uh, in this instance, you're flying from the right hand side to the left hand side and um, you've got a AAT tasks right in the middle. Now, um, again, convergent lines are really important, but 
in this sort of situation, it becomes even more important to try and keep in a straight line. Yeah, I remember one day flying uh, a task like this and I flew to, I think, point, I can't remember whether it was point C or B, imagine it was point C, and I saw this cracking good thermal over at point A. And I thought, well, I want to expand my distance as much as I possibly can. So I flew from point C to point A, um, got the thermal, which wasn't as good as I expected, and then ended up flying back to point C and then carried on to the, the task. Now, uh, it actually ended up being really, really costly. It slowed my time down something really, really dramatic because uh, basically the time I took to get from point C to point A to catch a good thermal and then get back to point C, the distance I gained in the task was way less than the distance I actually had ended up having to fly. And um, I wasn't gaining any extra speed. I actually got back to point C at the same height. So um, you could imagine this um, turn point as if it was a straight line. It wouldn't matter whether you flew straight to point A, point B or point C. And if you uh, just going past the turn point, then uh, um, it, it wouldn't really matter too much. So, um, yeah, so any questions on that? Um, I, I think I've um, pretty much covered most of the AAT discussion. So I think we need to sort of, um, yeah, open it up. Steve, it's Murray here. Yeah. Can you can you just clarify? Because I'm actually not quite sure myself. Where is the distance calculated from? If you've got a six kilometer wide, like three kilometer either side of st a start point start line. Yep. Is, is the distance calculated from the start point in the middle, or from where you cross the line, and and likewise with the finish? Where is that? Listen, I'm pretty sure it's actually start from the middle of the start line. Um, I've read, done a bit of reading, and um, there's quite a few people have said it's right in the middle of the start line, which is why it's important. Uh, why it's good to start on the right or left hand side if, if that's the best uh, line um, that you're going to take. And um, the distances uh, basically uh, expand out from the middle. So. Um, yeah. Do you know anything different? No, I don't. I've not, I've not actually thought of it before. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. So uh, when we go back to the um, where is it? this task here, um, it's pretty easy to understand uh, because uh, the maximum distance is the outside green line and the minimum is the inside green line. Uh, and um, so in between is, is uh, kind of a middle distance that you're going to end up flying. So any time that you go at right angles to that um, distance, you are expanding. So if you flew, um, I don't know if you can see my point, but if you flew from, uh, in this instance, from the middle to the outside, you are actually expanding your distance. Uh, but what you've got to be careful of is that you don't fly further than the gain you get in the distance. In this situation, you would. But it depends speed on your speed as, as well. It depends on your speed. So you've just got to remember an AAT task is not a distance task. Uh, really important to understand that it, it is a, a speed task. It is, you're racing. You're, you're, yeah. Steve, following on from Murray's question, what's the Where's the better place, generally speaking, unless there's a really strong convergence or whatever, for a start that is a circle, not a line? Um, I'm a little bit grey on that. I don't know if anybody else has got any comments on that. I would imagine that's at the very um, tip of the circle. Uh, it's actually the centre of the circle, I believe. For the centre of the circle. So when you, you're, you'll notice your GPS says you've got an extreme speed when you start because you've magically gone from the center of the circle to the edge of the circle almost instantly. Okay, so. I, I've, I've never actually done a start from a circle. So Tim, is that factored into the overall uh, speed, you know, your, your speed 
versus time thing at the end, once it, you know it's, we submit the file and all the rest of it, that's already calculated in. So if you start at the top of the circle and head off to the first turn point, yep. does it automatically calculate that back to the center point of the circle? For the Correct. Or the so you're basically getting a bit of distance for free. So you've got to be careful where you start on that circle. There's no point starting out the back of the circle, for example, because then you're going to have to travel more distance than you actually need to. But you're not penalised for starting at the top point of the circle closest to the first turn point? No. No, it's, it's an advantage. I guess another key thing to think about when you're starting a task is if you what the wind's doing. So normally, if there's no wind, starting in the middle of the start line would be the best because that's where you're being scored from, if it's a start line we're talking about. Whereas if you've got, like in this diagram here, wind uh, from the right-hand side flowing to the left, if you start the windward side of the line, you're going to have more downwind leg on your next leg. So you're getting free energy from the wind, basically. So that's something to think about. And it's a little bit um, uh, dependent on how far away the first turn point is. It um, becomes less important if uh, your first turn point is quite small and it's uh, 50 or 60 kilometres away. So, uh, but often we do get um, circles quite close in and yeah, it makes a big difference. Just going back to the um, uh, this um, expansive turn point, I think one of the days, I think Derek um, flew a contest day uh, in the Nationals and won it. And um, uh, Derek Shipley, that is. And he, um, a lot of the other pilots, uh, made the effort to go to point A and he just flew straight across point C and just touched the circle and managed to win the day. Um, and uh, I, I think that had quite a bit to do with it. He had a good second run as well, but uh, I think if you're uh, round about right on time, then uh, just clipping a turn point like this is actually a good thing. Yeah, what really matters is your deviations. So yep. it's no different to asking the question, is it worth deviating to a thermal inside the AAD circle as it is on track? And exactly, Tim. Straight lines, like I say down here, uh, try to keep straight lines. is really, really important. It covers less. So the, the general rules are if there's a good thermal, you know, up to 30 degrees or so is the most you'd want to deviate and anything more than that, you're paying a big penalty. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else got some questions or some uh, tactics that they might want to talk about? Can we have a little bit about um, task setting from those that are familiar with it? I understand that most tasks are worked out at like about 100 kilometres an hour speed. Can somebody talk a little bit more about that um, from the point of view of planning from those that are familiar? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I do a little bit of task setting, uh, often with Steve Wallace and other people. And the general, what we start off with when we're designing a task is we'll look at the speeds for the, what we expect the average speeds or the top speeds will be for the day. So if we expect a hundred kilometer an hour day, then we'll design the task to be about a hundred kilometers an hour to the centers of the circles in whatever time span we've got. So if we think it's gonna be a good, strong, long day and we've got plenty of daytime to play with, we'll make it a longer task and we'll aim for hundred kilometers an hour for that task. So then around that, you've got your circles, which gives you the option to fly more if it's stronger than we expect or less if it's worse than we expect. I think um, the more uncertainty there is with the weather, the bigger we'll make the circles generally. So 
often, especially around Taupo, for example, we might not know if we've got three turn points. We often have no idea how far you'll be able to push into the first one, for example, and you need to push. A, so we make the others much bigger. So it gives you room if you have to nick the first turn point, you can still complete the task at the expected speed in the other turn points. So it's quite tricky sometimes when the weather's very um, marginal. I think it's good for um, lower performance uh, gliders uh, in an AAT as well, because uh, being able to uh, do a shorter distance uh, means less less risk for uh, a lower performing glider compared to a high performing glider. Uh, high performing gliders have to go um, a much bigger distance and there's uh, a, a greater risk of an outlanding, even though they've got more performance. So, uh, yeah, I think they're a good thing to even out the field a bit. Tim, is that the reason why the, I mean, I'm no expert, but I've sat in a few and done a few contests for days and I've looked out the window, looked at the forecast and it looks rubbish, you know, it's looks so weak and you've got a two hour or two hour 15 task. Is the slack picked up on that by bigger circles just to cater for that potential that it's going to be a rubbish day, even more so than expected and, and you're going to have to trim your days down. But the time, instead of making a three hour task, for example, just make the circles bigger because that's kind of an easy way to do it and, it, and, it, and it's more even for everybody. Is that the logic in that or is there something else? Yeah, it's usually around, uh, the time is really set by how much daytime we think we've got. So if there's, if we know the weather's deteriorating, uh, we will make it a shorter task so that people can get going early and hopefully get home before the weather deteriorates completely. Um, or if it's the last night, we want people to get home for dinner, we'll make it a shorter task. And then once we know the task time, how much daytime we've got to play with, then we'll decide how big the task is going to be, uh, <laughs> how many kilometers and how, how much uncertainty there is, how big we need to make those circles. I think that last, um, that task you put up earlier, Steve, was a good example. That was a really weak day. We knew it was going to be a weak day. That one there. So you can see it's got big circles. Uh, it's two hours 15, maximum distance 400 kilometers. So obviously uh, you're not going to be doing the full 400 kilometers, even if you're the fastest glider. So you can, in that particular instance, from a competitor's point of view, you can choose, right, we have to push into one of these circles, but we don't have to push into all of them. So which ones are going to be the most likely to be the best? And in this case, that bottom circle was almost completely wiped out. So most people just nicked it and then got back to that one, two, three, fourth little circle. And uh, the fact we set big circles on the other two points made that possible. Steve talked sense. a little bit before, that's great. Um, Steve talked a little bit before about meteorology and that just to expand a little bit further in that, we've got such great Met information nowadays with SkySight and MetView and all these other ones in that. And from a sort of a micro level, we can pick, you know, to a fairly good degree of accuracy whereabouts in those circles we can actually plan to go. Uh, I, I think that as our information improves, so does our tech tactics and also our decision making even before we take off. We kind of have a pretty good idea of whereabouts we're going to go and coupled with the sort of size of the circles, we also know where the good bits and where the bad bits are going to be. Any comment? Yeah, we do find often the forecasts give an indication of the trend. So like, for example, they'll show that it's going to deteriorate throughout the day or get better as the day goes on. And so, but it's very hard to predict exactly when it will be unflyable. And like in this particular task, we knew the further south you go, the worse it will get. But at what point heading south is the point where you can't fly anymore? we weren't too sure, which is why there's a giant circle there. So, yes, sometimes you can pick out little areas, but generally it's not very accurate at predicting exactly how far you can fly. 
um, but you want to take it as a general general guide basically. Tim, four or five years ago we had um, a guy called Eve Gerster uh, visit us and he flew on the nationals and um, it was really interesting um, after the task had been set uh, he would have all his, gl his glider was completely prepared and he would just sit down uh, with a map and weather information on his computer and study um, the met for the day and uh, plan his task uh, before he even launched and uh, he was flying an old label and um, managed to win the win the competition uh, um, by quite a good margin. So um, studying the weather uh, before you do an AAT task is actually a really good thing to do. Yeah, and as you say, plan the actual, plan which circles you're intending to go into and uh, have a good idea which ones are you going to, are you going to have to maximise the first one, for example, is a key question because that reduces your risk later. Yep. But it's often earlier in the day, so it's not as strong earlier. But. Yeah, and it's good to look at um, what the end of the day is looking like as well, because uh, sometimes you'll get uh, good conditions later in the day, and other times you'll get um, a sea breeze or something wiping everything out. So you've actually got to um, work out what your um, latest start time is going to be. If you're not going to leave it too late. It's funny in us in New Zealand we're pretty much <laughs> we pretty much fly every bit of the day we can and unlike Australia you know if they set a two hour task you'd have about eight hours you could choose when when you fly that but in New Zealand we have about an hour at the most of leeway as to when you start your task because the weather just isn't that big and long um but it's only if the task set is really under set a day in New Zealand that you have a lot of choices to do you hang around and wait an hour or two before you start. Mm. See, Sebastian Kawa was another one who would spend a lot of time looking at the Met with the task and plan his task. So, I don't know, it's the best in the world, so maybe he's worth uh, following yeah. at some stage. Exactly. And often the, the period of time where we've got some um, spare time to plan a task is when we're sitting on the grid underneath the wings and just waiting for conditions to improve. And often, you know, guys just go away and sort of talk in groups. Sometimes you can actually um, sort of uh, tap on shoulders and say, how would you fly that task sort of thing from the guys that are really good at it. Um, but often that's the time when we have to actually put in that type of work. No, that's really good comments there. Okay. Anybody got anything else to um, ask? Or have we got any newer pilots that have, um, haven't done an AAT or uh, maybe done their first AAT and found it difficult to understand. Steve Jarrett here. Yeah. Yeah, I've done a few AATs now with the two regionals. And, you know, at my stage of flying competition, my goal was just to touch the circle and get around. And Listen, I, I, I think that's um, a, a really good goal. Um, far more inspiring than um, ending up landing in a paddock all the time. And uh, uh, yeah, so good on you. It's the way to do it. Well, a couple of things, John. John Baylor said one thing to me, which is do not go deep into the last circle, which is why one day I spent 15 minutes reading street signs over Matter Matter before getting home. Um, at the end of the day, very low, really scratching. Um, but the more I look at this, and as I've listened, because I used to race lasers, it seems to me it's understanding the weather and, you know, on a race course, working out where the boys are and how you're going to tackle it. You can do far more preparation than I've realised you could do. 
and it seems an absolute necessity. So your general rule, though, is to go deep into the first circle, if there is such a thing as a general rule. Yeah. It depends on the day, but yes, generally. It just gives you more options. So if things deteriorate quicker than expected, for example, you've already got a decent amount of distance and you can just nick the other circles. Yep. Stephen, what about the psychological preparation? Yeah, I, th yeah, I, I think um, there's, there's all sorts of um, preparation you can do. A lot of people just uh, don't think about it. They dump it in the glider and jump on the glider and away they go and um, uh, just fly around the task. Well, if, if you're um, not a top competition pilot and you just want to get around the task, that's fine. There's no problem with that. Um, if you uh, are a fairly new pilot and you decide, oh, I'm going to race right around the um, the biggest part of the task and uh, do really well and not think about the timing, um, then first of all, there's more risk of landing out. And secondly, um, uh, yeah, you're probably not going to get around. You're not going to achieve the speed you need um, to, to do well. And that can be frustrating. So I think, um, it's a thinking game, and uh, that's why they're enjoyable. So if you, the more you think about it, the, the, the better you'll do. If you don't think about it at all, then yeah, you're going to struggle to, to do well on an AAT task. Can we talk a little bit about start line sort of uh, mistakes in that that we often see and how to get around them? You know, there are certain parts of the rules which can trip up people and they don't kind of realize that they've even transgressed until the, uh, the scorer or the competition director says, I want to have a chat with you. Um, can we talk a little bit about that from guys that have analyzed tasks and seen these mistakes uh, made? I think the biggest one's missing the start line because you've put in a 6K radius instead of 3K radius. That's the most common mistake with task in inserting your task, no matter what, no matter whether it's racing or AAT. Um, there aren't too many other mistakes you can make with our task starts unless there's a max start height. Uh, but we don't do that very often in New Zealand because we're happy with any height. Yes. Yeah, it's always a, a good competition tactic to start as high as you possibly can um, at a time when it's going to make the most of the weather. Um, and um, uh, a lot of people, the difference between starting a thousand foot lower than everybody else is uh, quite a glide. It's, it's a lot of time a difference. So, uh, but that's general competition tactics rather than uh, specific to AAT. Yeah, and it is amazing how many people start a lot lower than they should be. Um, and it's pretty rare you have disintegrating weather around the start line, but occasionally you do, and you do have to start no matter what. But it's pretty rare. And just, right. It's Murray here again. Can I just add a couple of comments here? Um, I know we're talking about AATs, but if you're doing badge flights, your start distance is much narrower. You've got half a K, a 1K line, so it's half a K either side of the start point. So you've got to make sure that you nail that. I had a look at Terry's flight. He sent that one to me, that the one he did talked about. He crossed the start line right by the start point. Unfortunately, it was in the wrong direction. And by the time he turned around, he was like, and, and started heading on task, he was outside the start line because it's so narrow. So that's a consideration there. And just while I'm talking about badge flights as well, if you're doing a badge flight at the start time, you need to consider the, the height you start at. You need to think about what height you're going to have when you finish, because you're only allowed a thousand meter loss of height over the flight. <laughs> that um, caught me out a couple of times. 
Yeah, certainly for, for badge flying and record flying, um, the start and finish line um, uh, is a big factor. And um, I've talked to Edward, our uh, awards officer. Uh, uh, he's shown me a number of um, what would have been world record flights uh, that were stuffed up because they didn't realize that it was 500 meters either side of a point uh, as the start. And um, yeah, it can happen. It's happened multiple times. Yeah. Just in terms of preparation too, you can, if you're going to a competition, you can consider today as preparation for tomorrow. So you can learn a lot by having a go at an AAT task and then having a look at what other people did on that day. I think that's a great learning tool of people and people are willing to share, especially after the event, they won't want to tell you about what they can do on that day, but they'll be happy to talk about what they did yesterday. So that's a golden opportunity if you've got C or something and access to their IGC file to have a look and, and say, well, where did they go? And, you know, they took a different energy line to me. So great opportunity to learn something and apply it in the future. Yep, learn from your mistakes. Uh, that's how you go forward. So, uh, um, and we all make plenty of mistakes. So, uh, learning from them is, is a really good way to get ahead. I prefer to learn from your mistakes, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the big decisions that we have to make often in Matter Matter, particularly, is is it a ridge day or is it a thermal day? And that can make a big difference as to whether you go in a straight line or continuously have to circle. And uh, even that basic decision makes a difference between uh, doing well or landing out. And uh, it's such a basic decision that has to be made just about every time, matter, matter particularly. Haven't you noticed that the task setters are out to get us on that one? They keep putting tasks so you don't know whether to go to the ridge or to thermal for that very reason, don't they, Tim? Sure do. Although it's almost always fastest to go along the ridge up to 30 degree um, deviations. Uh, and if you've got a ridge line, actually, and you can see that there's a good line of energy, then up to 40 degrees or even 45 degrees or even a bit more might pay off. <laughs> There's an interesting. Um, just put a, a video out. Well, it was on YouTube the other day. It's probably been out for a few weeks, but quite good on some of his decision making, flying on the ridge, or was he going to jump out the valley and do some thermals and whatnot. So if you haven't seen that, just ch chase down his YouTube channel and have a look. It was in Matter Matter, flying back to Drury on a sort of average set of day, got low at one point and all the rest of it. But just some decision making thoughts in there were quite good. Yeah, I thought yeah. Stefan's videos are quite interesting because there's. Another video of his where he's taking the Auckland Club's disc, Discus 2 BI up um, past Thames and he is so low and he's saying things like, well, I just have to land on the beach. <laughs> and I'm thinking, it's not your glider you're talking about, is it, Stefan? <laughs> There's not much beach. True. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions, I think we can probably wrap it up around here, Tim. What do you reckon? And, um, I hope yeah. everybody's got a little bit out of it. Um, if anybody wants um, any of the uh, slides, just let me know. Um, but downloading the um, uh, AAT tactics from uh, Cumulus Soaring is really worthwhile. It's good to read through that, especially if you have an UDI. Um, and um, it'll tell you exactly which screens or what information you should have up on your machine. And Steve, I think that that itself might make a talk because you get bunnies like me who go to their first competition and they've got the tablet that uh, Tim told them to buy and they put it on the boxes that someone told them to buy and they still use and they still don't really understand what those boxes are telling them and how to make some decisions. And I think, Tim, you'd be well placed to do a talk like that because you're cunning and a task setter. Yeah, although I still stuff it up. <laughs> but Less often than me. Yeah, no, yeah, knowing the, when um, to turn and get your timing right, just right, 
so you're not too long after the, the task time. It takes a lot of practice and it's so easy. What people forget is when you turn it around and start your final glide, your final glide is so much faster than stopping the thermal. So it's very common to come in under time if you're not careful. And you're way better off being over time, as Steve pointed out. So that's probably the most critical thing for EATs. Make sure you're over time, not under time. Richard Frawley's article um, does explain a lot, Gerard. It's actually, um, it tells you a lot about the boxes and what they do. Uh, so, uh, yeah, as I said, read it. It's got some good information. All righty. Anybody actually see what um, uh, efficiency, have you heard the term efficiency? Does anybody understand that particular parameter that you see on XC saw and other ones? Do you know what it means? No, I haven't heard of that one, uh, Russell. Mm. What's he explaining to us? Sorry, what's that? Sorry, I haven't heard of that, Russell. Yeah, heard that. Somebody else said something. Yeah, Higgy Wood here saying, why don't you explain it to us now? <laughs> I don't have the answer. Oh, okay. No idea, sorry. I haven't used that one. All right. Oh, thank you, Tom. No, thank you, everyone. We'll... Um, Stop the sharing and uh, Bob Gray, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, Tim. Just to confirm, is this the last of our webinar series for the moment, or have we got another one? Well, planned? well, um, depending on Jacinda, we, we're e eagerly anticipating that we'll be out at the gliding club next Saturday. Um, but yeah, we're not certain of that, but I think it's uh, pretty well going to happen that we'll be back at some sort of um, gliding activity um, on, on the weekend, next weekend. So uh, yeah, you've got nothing planned and... Um, we may well organize some more talks, so I'm assuming at some stage, but uh, there'll be more ad hoc rather than a weekly thing. Yeah, and I guess if we're gonna do them again, we wouldn't do them on the weekend like this. We only did them on the weekends because this is when we normally go gliding. Um, so it'll probably be a midweek thing and then that introduces other issues of people's availability and timing and all that carry on. So um, on the other hand, if you then put them on the web, then everyone can get to them at some stage. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So yeah, I guess this is um, the last one we've got of, of this in this format. Um, so thanks for listening, everyone. And um, yep. And just a reminder, you can see them all on YouTube and our YouTube channel for Piaco Gliding Club. If you want to, if you missed any of the previous ones or want to watch this one again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. <laughs>